We're just about to start session two, uh, which is constructing for an evolving ecology, climate change policies in the city. And um, Alan Penn will be chairing the session, and I'm handing over to Alan. Okay, um, thanks very much. Um, I think we'll do what we saw in the first session and, uh, and ask the various speakers to come up and uh, take a seat. Let me just introduce them. Uh, Christina Murphy and Andrea Bertassi are going to be doing a, a double act. Um, Christina started her architectural trajectory at OMA um, and co-founded in 2009 XCoop um, in Rotterdam. It's a think tank that analyzes contemporary living. And at the moment, Christina is designing an integrated sustainable master plan for social housing in Soyapango, El Salvador. Um, Andrea collaborated with um, the OMA in Rotterdam and was also a co-founder of XCoop. Um, and he takes an analytic approach which he combines with playful creativity, um, pr uh, committed to the principles of universal design. So this is going to be entertaining. Um, second in, or second third in line is um, Duncan Wilson. Um, Duncan has joined um, as PI um, of the new Intel Collaborative uh, Research Institute for Sustainable Connected Cities at UCL. Um, and this is a collaboration between UCL and Imperial College London and Intel um, as a tremendously exciting um, venture in thinking about smart and future cities. Um, and he's going to be talking a bit about um, some of the projects that are going on through that new centre. This is a very much an open IP initiative in, in the line with the way that Intel works. Um, next, uh, Judith uh, Campion. Um, Judith is um, Director of Sustainable Architecture and Research at ADAS um, in the R&D group, and she's leading a cross-industry collaboration, um, well, a whole series of them, actually, but the main one here um, is one that comes out of a program called Carbon Buzz, um, which is about providing um, no fault letting on about when your buildings fail. But anyway, I'll let her, let her talk about this, and I'm sure she'll talk about other things. So please do join us. Yep. Um, finally, there's um, two panelists who are not presenting papers. Uh, Volker Muller. Um, Volker is a design computing expert um, and with great experience in development and implementation of architectural technology. Um, welcome, Volker. Um, and um, his focus is on BIM, so it's going to be very interesting to hear how this uh, technology that we've heard is, comes from the 1980s is now really beginning to take shape, in, certainly in the UK uh, context. Um, and finally, Peter Feldman, um, who is one of our key organisers here, and Peter is an architect and urban designer currently working as project leader for OMA. Um, director of the Space Agency and part of the Smart Geometry Planning Committee. Um, and he's teaching at the Welsh School of Architecture in Cardiff. Um, and um, he was the project architect on London's first cable car, um, the, the Emirates cable car across the Thames. So, thanks very much. Um, I think without more ado, I'm going to ask um, Christina um, and Andrea to do their double act. Okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, afternoon, everybody. So our question to, um, to give an answer today was how do we as designer design for and within the evolving contemporary cities yet to come? However, and assuming that the 90% of the cities um, now they growing and being built are informally designed uh, by people that live in the cities, we ask ourselves, what about the 10%? Is only the 10% that has been designed? And so if that is really true, as designers, are we really relevant? And if so, um, I mean, and if we are not, are we just an outdated figure that is witnessing all this informality growing? So um, our team is asking this question on a daily basis, whether we are relevant or not while building the cities of today. 
And uh, while brainstorming all together about uh, giving us an answer, firstly to ourselves, we came up with a so-called er sustainable urban integrated toolbox, which is a lot of words for a simple uh, game that we're playing in the office. And it brings together a multidisciplinary um, team of people um, in, in relationship to design and urban planning. We're trying to input uh, the design and the planning of, uh, of the city together with the sustainability while, while thinking about future cities. So the aim of the toolbox is designing for people. And uh, most importantly, however, is not that us as designers design for them, but rather we prefer to call ourselves supporting their lives. So we sustain their lives while we are doing our, our game. Uh, the first implementation to this toolbox, which is still an ongoing uh, catalog of inputs and stimulations, is the El Bosque project. Um, it's a site in uh, Central America, in El Salvador. And uh, uh, it's a set of, as I said before, is a multidisciplinary tool box. So it's a set of, uh, of rules that we are building at every occurrence and uh, that informs our design. The, one, the first tool that we're using, it's obviously the place, the location in which we are operating. In this case, we're operating in, a, uh, in, a, in Central America. We are operating in a site that has been assigned by the municipality of the city that we are in, which is called Soyapango. And it's a site that it's um, um, more fortunate, uh, fortunate that the site where are they currently living, who is currently living. We're talking about inhabitants um, that in this uh, particular situation is uh, vulnerable, uh, poor people that need to be relocated in more safety locations uh, due to uh, seasonal um, mudslides and um, yeah, bad weather, if you want to call it that way. They are mostly catastrophe. And people, poor people, vulnerable people usually settle in places that are not organized and therefore also subject to be uh, washed away every time there is a, catast a natural catastrophe occur occurring. This is a site that was assigned to us to relocate uh, a few of these people. We are talking about a thousand uh, uh, people for about 200 families. And the site was already difficult for it, like the, the, the game was a, a little bit difficult to be played. The site is hilly, so um, for social housing this uh, provides already a problem because uh, simple and standard construction could not just be, just be applied on a, on a hill. Uh, there has been a decay, of, I mean um, 10, years, 10 years ago there has been already projects being uh, implemented in this area. So the first thing is to think of is um, how to remove what is being already been built. Uh, the site is being surrounded by two uh, violent gangs, so uh, that also impedes a little bit our operation, and it's terribly connected, if not at all, not connected at all. Uh, the people that is going to be living in this area has only one thing in common, uh, which is poor and desperation, poor poverty and desperation. Uh, they come from different backgrounds, different family uh, situations, and different identities. One of the other two components of our toolbox is to establish which kind of society is going to be living in this location and what kind of identity we are talking about. Uh, the profile, basically, people profile. Uh, we're talking about elderly that need some sort of assistance, so our architecture need to think about uh, locating them on ground floor. We're talking about kids that uh, below the age of 11 are usually embracing uh, violence gangs because it's the easiest way to uh, get a future for themselves. And we're talking about women, uh, vulnerable women that cannot provide an economy for themselves because they need to attend their children, which don't have a daycare to go to. Um, uh, a, basic, uh, um, a basic operation that we do is to create a community by simply input some common sense activities that could help and to relieve the situation and give an identity to this population, this new community. So uh, we are talking about community center, daycare, schools, um, hospitals and, uh, and plazas and also the possibility of creating flexible housing that can accommodate um, workshops as well. In fact, one of the studies when, when we talk about place, society, and identity is also to understand the typology we're working with. We're talking about um, affordable housing, so it needs to be relatively cheap. At the same time, however, it's very ambition in its uh, typology. We need to understand that uh, we're talking about people that work and live in the same uh, area. The square meters are really small, but yet needs to be 
efficient because the w women needs to work, generating an economy for a family that is usually run, run by a mother, single mother. They have kids that needs to stay at home because they're not facility welcoming these kids. At the same time, there are generational houses, which means that the family usually is, doesn't come only with the mother and the kids, but it comes with grandfathers, grand-grandfathers, and we need to understand how the, the house can grow in the future or, um, on the contrary, shrink. Um, seemingly, as uh, designers, we need to understand that the, um, when designing in developing countries or, I mean, yeah, um, children cannot be sharing the same room as the adults for sexual abuses. Uh, economy and environment, environment is also part of our tools. We are looking at the, at the economy in the sense that uh, nowadays, after the, the big crisis, after 2009, uh, NGOs, international NGOs, are not supporting developing countries in the way they were doing before. They were mostly charities and giving out houses and allowing uh, certain strata of the population to just parasite on, uh, on inter international aid. Nowadays, uh, the situation is different. The population has been asked to open um, loans. My Loans mostly assigned to women, and uh, this in implies that the, uh, the, uh, the people needs to, um, to to work in order to repay the loan back. And how do we do this? Uh, if we are talking about, as I said before, an isolated uh, place that is not well connected and a place that is being thought only as affordable houses. As designer, we have to think about bringing an economy into the neighborhood. So housing is not the only thing that we need to design. We need to design also work accommodation for uh, working spaces and good connection to the rest of the area, not only the neighborhood. Um, and the, and there, at the same time, we need to understand their skills. We cannot impose our skills and just uh, tell them, okay, now you generate your own economy. We need to see what they are good at and try to um, sort of um, inject some entrepreneurship uh, skills to, um, like, they generate something and they need to uh, sell it as well. Other things that are influencing our game is uh, to look at all this, the, the, the state, the, the whole, the stakeholders at play. We're not only talking about the future inhabitants, but you're also talking about who is going to invest in this area. Um, okay, there are microloans that are being assigned to the population who goes, who goes and live there, but who is gonna cover the rest of the um, yeah, of the finances. So we were thinking of, uh, we are, we are uh, making up a lot of strategy, market strategy. One could be, for instance, to uh, to get the first uh, the first phase in is the allocation of each lot, and every fam family uh, puts in some money. Uh, little by little, the, the lot grows and becomes uh, a structure, a house, an extended house, a productive house, and here you get a mini neighborhood, which is complete with all the ingredients of a community. Um, looking at the site, and on an urban point of view, we were looking at the possibility as an investor to think of a scattered um, layout or rather a compact one to then think about uh, evolution of the site or development of the site in a timely way and when finances are more uh, fortunate. Um, uh, one of the last uh, tools that we are um, ap applying is technology and partic participation. Technology and participation in the mean that, um, as I said before, designers are not there to impose their, uh, their will, and especially they are not there to stay. We need to understand what they want and what is necessary for them to continue and, main and maintain their, uh, their new uh, neighborhood and communities. Vocational, of course, um, courses are extremely important because we can teach or share knowledge uh, together and understand what are the most important points of their um, su to sustain their lives. Finally, design and follow up. It's a little bit a uh, repetition of terminology. In any case, it's us being there and giving ingredients for them to continue their susta sustainability later on. We are coming up with a, a catalog of ingredients. They are extremely standard, and as designer, we can also call them boring. Coming from my background at OMA, we were thinking about something uh, totally else when talking about design. Now we have to redimension our ambition and look at the most simple but yet efficient unit that can become millions of other things. Because uh, when thinking about El, El Bosque, for instance, we are not thinking about a location, we're thinking about a, a, a lot of different locations in which our toolbox can, um, can be then applied. 
Um, just really quickly before I give um, the mic to Andrea, this is um, a little bit of the different possibilities that we applied. I don't know if they are really visible on the screen. Um, on the um, on the site of El Bosque, we create a community as a condo sort of uh, uh, landscape. Thinking about this, we are also thinking of how roofs can collect water or how roof can yeah, harvest energy through water and sun. How can the facade be streaming uh, the interior uh, through, uh, through their materiality? How can we keep the uh, circulation really low, or at least reduce uh, public um, reduce private transportation, and facilitate uh, public transportation via tuk-tuk and uh, funiculars, for instance? Uh, we can think about a scattered uh, evolution of the site. Is the same amount of dwellings, but represented in different in different ways, or more compact to create a, um, a more yeah a more compact community? And these are just flies over. And then uh, this is another project that uh, we have been uh, doing a few years ago, and that's uh, kind of uh, in the same way of designing uh, a process and designing an approach more than designing a space. And um, this uh, is a challenge that is uh, thrown every year: is design against the elements and. Um, uh, we, we find it that sometimes uh, like designing against the elements is, is a tough challenge because in some areas in the world, uh, mostly in this 90% of the population of the world, uh, the, the elements can be pretty strong and uh, very difficult to control. And uh, as you can see, this is in Manila, the Philippines, which was the, the site uh, where we were assigned this, for this competition, which by the way we lost. You can see that um, the, the city is really like, it, it happens a few times a year to leave the city in a very uh, different way than what it has been designed uh, for. And um, sometimes you can also learn quite a lot of uh, like how to uh, uh, like use the city and the infrastructure in an unusual way, uh, pre pretty interesting um, to us. And uh, for this, uh, in this specific case, uh, we, we started like thinking, okay, what uh, do we need to do? What do we, do we need to face in order to design against the elements in this particular case of uh, Manila? And uh, obviously design, uh, the, the design part of the challenge uh, was like dealing with the usual suspect of, uh, of our job, which was like a very tight budget because it was like uh, $25 per square foot, which is pretty tight also in the Philippines. And then uh, there was a certain amount of program to be put uh, in terms of uh, social housing, and then issues about the identity, because those people are like um, basically facing um, uh, changing their own environment every time there's a typhoon, which is like uh, once a year at least. And, and then there was like the elements, which in this particular case were really uh, unfortunate. like. Um, Mostly the, the, the biggest uh, challenge was these typhoons that uh, happen pretty often. And um, considering the tight budget, uh, we uh, discarded immediately to build uh, with steel structures or, because, or concrete because that would be uh, very expensive and, and uh, over our budget. And then we also, um, yeah, we, we were basically considering uh, how little we could do with that amount of money, and we, we thought maybe we should just uh, try to propose another location and relocate these people. And actually, that was not uh, so stupid because that's what they actually do. Uh, they, which in terms of community, it's it's really wonderful. We think they basically, uh, when the um, typhoon is about to come, they organize in groups and they try to really move out the site literally. So they they really move their barracks out. Uh, still, uh, we thought it is a bit expensive in terms of uh, efforts. So maybe we thought instead of um, uh, designing against the element, we should maybe try to, uh, to design with the elements and then make use of these uh, enormous forces that they are and then leave the, the community living in their own typologies and just correct uh, what you see on top is basically the strong winds uh, are basically blowing away the, the little houses because they are poorly constructed and the budget didn't allow to do much more than that. But then we thought maybe we can cover everything with a structure which could take the wind in an aerodynamic way and just protect whatever was underneath. So kind of uh, compacting a bit their own typologies, change slightly the, the distribution of the common spaces and just 
go into, into this uh, technology. Then we were really excited and we looked into local technologies uh, like bamboo and, and we were um, pleased to see that you can do uh, really a lot with bamboo. And um, the only problem was that uh, the structural engineer said, yeah, this is possible and this also fit in the budget. The thing is that if uh, just one thing goes wrong in this thing, it's, it's really a disaster, much uh, worse than uh, before. So we didn't want to take that uh, responsibility. And um, what we started doing was like looking around the site and we found out that um, this site is about three kilometers away from the airport of Manila and there's a boneyard as well uh, next to the airport. So dismissed airplanes uh, get to the site and we thought, well, in a very windy place, what uh, can be used is maybe like taking dismissed uh, aircraft and there's uh, nothing more difficult than making an airplane fly when you chop the wings. And then uh, basically what we did is like a research on typologies of aircraft also that was uh, well available and due to be available soon. And we proposed to basically transport those aircrafts to the site. Uh, we overlapped the typology which was asked uh, from the brief and uh, it, it uh, pretty much fitted. So we uh, basically designed uh, nothing but just overlapping the typologies into aircraft. And we were uh, also um, so, um, happy of the fact that by just reusing something, like uh, prolonging the, the lifespan of this aircraft, you can easily uh, make, uh, not only design against the element, but also like contributing to uh, not modifying the climate. So like the climate change, uh, is going to be uh, a, a tiny bit less uh, thanks to this intervention because you can recycle water, you can filter it easily. An aircraft is uh, supposed actually to go in a very wide range of temperatures because it can go uh, a lot uh, uh, lower than zero and then up to 80 uh, up, um, in, in the summer. And then uh, you can see you can reuse the water. It's a pretty smart uh, engineering. And this is what like the... Uh, the, foot, the ecological footprint of this project compared like, uh, to the traditional way of building the same amount of housing with the local and, and uh, traditional uh, way. So on the left you see the impact you would have with the traditional thing and uh, just uh, chopping wings to, uh, from aircraft would be the right uh, columns. And also in terms of identity we, we found it a bit odd but uh, in a kind of pleasant way. We kind of like it. And by the way, this is the winning scheme. They went for containers in uh, steel structure, so uh, uh, we are happy for them because they won. But we didn't really give up because uh, this project became, uh, is actually becoming these days a um, um, little illustrated book for kids to sensitize them to uh, lifespan and upcycling of objects. So that's, uh, like, that's something that we started up ourselves. We like the idea and uh, it should be out uh, hopefully soon. And uh, this is another project, uh, uh, again, like in Central America, in Haiti, um, and that's uh, where we try to apply a bit more um, consistently our, our approach, which is basically to share an intelligence which is global, so it's towards uh, um, yeah, a global intelligence to, to a very local um, uh, thing. Um, it's based on the invention of a Dutch inventor which uh, basically patented a way to transform the debris into new raw material to, to then make bricks. And uh, from these bricks, uh, involve the local community to build up their own uh, new houses. Now, uh, nowadays, there are like something like 300 million dollars from the United States invested to just move the debris from Port-au-Prince <laughs> Uh, to the nature, they have to, to liberate the, the place and then basically they are dumping stuff in the nature which is pretty polluting. And this thing is also like leaving the, yeah, the citizens out of jobs because there are like uh, foreigner companies uh, coming in to do this uh, kind of thing. While with this system we think uh, it, it could really make a change not only, only in, the, in the ecological thing but also in the building up the community. So uh, here you see uh, how you can make the typologies uh, and uh, basically get variations according to the needs of the, of the 
people going to be living there, and they will be involved in the making of it. And this entire thing is basically a, a, a mobile factory, which is uh, fitting in two containers, can be shipped all over the place, like wherever there's a need for it, we can do it, we can move it there. And uh, right now, we are uh, almost done with the raising of the first uh, million euros which are needed to start the first 100 houses in Haiti for this. And after those uh, first 100 units, the project starts being profitable. So everybody can invest in this thing and get uh, even money out of it. It's going to be a lower interest rate than, than usual uh, investment, like of stock, etc. But still, it's going to be... Um, profitable. So that's like, if anybody is interested, uh, we can talk about it uh, later. Okay, so basically, um, yeah, I I'm done. Yeah, um, well, this is like the same project, but then uh, maybe next time. And to go back to the initial question, um, whether design is relevant or not, we definitely think it is. Uh, if you are able to connect all our theoretical studies and our, like, uh, also egos to design stuff, to shift it to what is really necessary for people to uh, live better. So if you bring the human being still in the, to the center, then it's definitely relevant, and we can actually make the world a better place. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you.